Welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. As we approach personal growth using the lens of personality types, we talk about growing your cognitive functions. And we often have a recommended way to go about that that we talk about here at Personality Hacker. In recent podcasts, we've talked a little bit about growing your sixth function just a few episodes ago. And we typically have that one soundbite, grow your auxiliary or co-pilot function, whatever that is for you in your personality, that's the biggest bang for your buck. And one thing that we, I'm sure we've talked about from time to time in different episodes, but one thing may not be clear to you listening is that as we think about the functions that you're using in your personality, you have a driver or dominant cognitive function based on how you're wired that really informs pretty much everything else. In fact, in a lot of ways, all of the functions support this dominant function showing up for you. And we tend to not talk a lot about the dominant function as far as development goes. And maybe you could ask the question in your own mind, well, I guess, wouldn't it just be handled when I develop all the other functions in my personality? Or maybe it's something I've been doing all my life, so it's probably pretty well developed already, right? Like I don't need to do any active work on it because just showing up as who I am in my daily life, it's probably exercising that and building skill using that because we use it all the time. So today we want to talk a little bit about the dominant function. Your driver, if you're using the car model here at Personality Hacker, how does this inform your growth path as a person? And what do we mean by growing your dominant? Or how, do you, how would you even focus on that? Or what should you be thinking about as we focus on growing that aspect of us? I think it's important to understand our relationship to not just the functions themselves, like like the the qualities and characteristics of each of these functions, but also understanding where they're at positionally uh, for us. And I think when you look at different models, like um, like there's been some really helpful models. John Beebe's eight function model is really helpful. Um, but recently, Dario Nardi, uh, we were on a we were hosting an event with him on personality one sidedness. And he mentioned that what's nice about John Beebe's model is that Beebe has given us an idea of how each of these shows up almost like personas, like different parts of who we are. But there's another way to look at these functions, and that is um, how are we manifesting them? How are we engaging with them in our day-to-day lives? Not just ways that they could trip, trip us up or the relationship we have to them as if they were a person or an individual, but also, how are we, you know, sort of implementing them in the outside world, and what's our relationship to them as we use them? And so, I think what's nice about the idea of seeing the dominant function or building a strong relationship with the dominant is as we use all of these other functions, functions two through eight. But of course, we mostly focus on um, the first four functions here at Personality Hacker for a reason, for reasons that we think are important. But really getting a good feel for how you're using your dominant and your relationship to your dominant then helps inform your relationship to functions two through eight. Just a real quick uh, side note for someone that might be a new listener. If you're a new listener and you are like, functions, what's that? Car model, what's that? If you head over to personalityhacker.com and search car model, and cognitive functions, a whole wealth of information is going to come up for you to be able to dive deeper in this and have a reference for what we're talking about today. So the the dominant function or driver is effectively you, right? It's how you see yourself. And so this idea that, well, you know, I'm using it all the time, so it should be developed or exercised is a pretty good assumption to make as long as you yourself are the kind of person who takes life by the horns, If you're the kind of person who sees life as an opportunity of growth and development and an opportunity to stretch yourself and to go try new things and to see, you know, challenges and overcome those challenges and build self-esteem, then yeah, there's a pretty solid bet that your dominant function has serviced you through that entire experience. Like it's served you well, it's been growing with you. It's unlikely that you have been taking the bull by the horns without using your dominant function. That would be a very frustrating experience through life. But if you're a person who tends to be afraid of life, um, maybe sort of leans back and uh, maybe is dealing with a lot of different circumstances or situations that have 
cut the legs out from under you and you lack self-esteem or self-worth or self-confidence and you you have a sense of um, like, like you're not supposed to be bringing yourself to the world, you lack permission, then your dominant function is probably going to reflect that as well. And those are two s- sort of opposite sides where most of us fit somewhere in between. Most of us fit somewhere in between taking life by the horns and hiding from life. And so our dominant function is going to reflect that as well. It's going to reflect where we're at in our relationship to our self-esteem, our self-confidence, and how many challenges we've encouraged ourselves to overcome. So most of us, because we fall somewhere in between those, those two extremes, most of us have work we still need to do in our dominant function. And it could be seen as the work that we have to do as people. Right. All of us have work to do as people and we're going to probably, probably try to solve those challenges using our best weapons, using our best tools, the things that we feel are the strongest components of who we are and also our foundational components. And that dominant or driver function is basically that it's the it's we're the fish and water in it. It's the full experience that it's hard for us to see outside of. And so there are almost always opportunities to stretch it, right? Like there's almost always opportunities to observe, oh, I might have gotten into a comfort zone with how I use my dominant or driver function. I may have gotten to a place where I'm. this gets me the, the highest gain almost immediately. And so these other components of my, of my dominant or driver, I'm, I'm really kind of not looking at those. And a great way to assess what kinds of comfort zones you might fall into is uh, picking up Dario Nardi's Magic Diamond. He talks about this idea of holistic versus analytic characteristics that each of the functions can come with. The analytic is a more focused, like sharply in tuned relationship with the functions themselves. And the holistic is more of sort of an open frame, more less focused and targeted, but more open to other ideas and a little more diffused energy. And so we can have either of these relationships with our functions, particularly our dominant. We may use our dominant sharply. We might use it to sort of cut through the space of the world and try to get things accomplished and sort of move our energy through everything or, or try to really get to the end result quicker or more in a more targeted way. Or we may use our dominant function to, you know, sort of have an open view of the world or open view of who we are inside and play, play around with ideas a little bit more and have less of a, my job is to cut a swath through life and more of like my job is to understand things or, or see multiple different sides. And so your dominant function, every function can have both of these components to it and your dominant function is going to favor one over the other. So what are the opportunities to grow the other side? Or what are the opportunities to see the different facets of how this thing can show up in life, this part of you can show up in life, and not have to just keep grabbing the same old tool and staying in a comfort zone? Another component, I think, to the dominant driver function that's important to remember is that every other function you use is being used in service to it. And it's hard to see that sometimes. In two different ways. The first is if you're trying to develop or grow other functions, sometimes it's difficult for us to recognize that we're using those functions because we kick them to our dominant so quickly. It's almost like we, as soon as we start using another function, it gets exciting to our dominant function and it kind of wants to grab the wheel of the car and start running with it. And so sometimes we're using other functions that we don't even realize we're using because any sort of return on it immediately gets kicked to the dominant. An example of this is as an ENTP, I've been trying to be more conscientious about my uh, fifth function of introverted intuition or what we call perspectives. And I noticed I was using introverted intuition in times that I didn't know that that's what, it, the, what I was using because the second I got an aha or an insight using that function, it immediately kicked over to my extroverted intuition and I wanted to go talk about it with somebody. I wanted to go, I, I found it fascinating. I want to go get as much information as humanly possible on this and have, you know, great conversations around understanding this in bigger applications and how it ties to everything else. But if I had slowed down enough to recognize the moment in which I was quiet, I was inside my own mind, I was probably in the shower, and I was just having this sort of ruminating burgeoning insight that was delivered to be to me by my mind 
if I had given myself an opportunity to like pause and observe that as opposed to immediately rushing to, you know, fillet it out in every possible way using my extroverted intuition, I may have given myself more opportunities to do true development of it as opposed to simply serving my dominant, which is what we all have a tendency to do. When we're using these different functions, we have a tendency to immediately want to kick it to that dominant. And then it's all of a sudden in the dominant's domain, uh, you know, where it could have been a more pure developmental opportunity for that other function. Same thing happened at our most recent profiler training event. We do what's called embodiment exercises. And we were doing an exercise around extroverted intuition. And an INTJ reported to me afterward, they said that they, they got in the brainstorming. It was kind of a brainstorming activity we were doing around something that was trying to pattern something outward, right? Uh, intuitively. And they said, as soon as they got the ideas, they wanted to like go away by themselves and just ruminate on some of the understandings that came up for them. And they wanted to kick it to their NI, their introverted intuition process, which is what they lead with as their dominator driver as an INTJ. So I think this is, we all, these are just two examples of what we probably all tend to do when things come up in our other functions. We're routing them through that lens of that dominant. Yeah, alternatively, when we're trying to focus on development of other functions, sometimes we're using our dominant and thinking we're using other functions. That's the other way it can go. So the first way is that we're using other functions but kicking it so quickly to the dominant that it gets lost in the process. And the other is that we think we're using another function, but it's just a manifestation of our driver or dominant. <laughs> and so it gets confusing. Our relationship to this function, to this driver function, can confuse us when we're trying to develop other aspects of who we are, which is why it's so easy to become one-sided. It's so easy to stay into, in that comfort zone and that place in which we identify ourselves the most, because sometimes it's hard to tell when we're doing it and not doing it anyway. Well, I think the thing that really complicates it is that this is the world that we swim in. It's like a fish in water. Often it's hard to see in an abstract way how I'm using my driver function, my dominant function, because I'm using it so much that it's like, how do I get, how do I see it from outside of myself? Like everything's routed through it. So even the ability to see it kind of leans on it in a way. And I think that can be the challenge is it's, again, it's like a fish in water. It's hard for a fish to be aware that it's in water. It's their entire reality around them. Yeah, that's not to demonize our dominant or, or our relationship to it. Like that's not intended to say that you shouldn't be using it as much as you are. It's just a way to self-reflect and ask if we're not overusing it in the sense that it's the wrong tool for the job, but over relying on it as the only tool for any job. And that's really what you want to get away from. So when you're trying to determine your relationship with that function and whether or not it's exercised enough, it's I mean, it's it's a moment to take an honest reflection or assessment of ourselves as people because it oftentimes reflects where we're at as as an individual. What are some of the biggest challenges that I meet as a person, not that I'm meeting as an ENTP? What are some of the self-esteem challenges or self-confidence challenges or maybe just challenges in engaging with my environment? Some of those challenges will be a good assessment for where my dominant function is at as well because it's been with me on this entire journey and this entire ride. So when a person has a good, strong relationship or understands, can take a meta perspective on themselves and really understand where they're at in their relationship to this function, that's when it's good to check in with your auxiliary function and see where that is at. And and quite honestly, what I've observed, and one of the reasons why the soundbite is always develop your auxiliary or develop your co-pilot, is the more you rest in and rely on that co-pilot or auxiliary function, the more it forces you to flex the muscle of the dominant as well. Because the two of them in conjunction with each other is really actually the tool. It's like it's those merged together that are the genius, not them in isolation. So oftentimes when you're developing your auxiliary and really trying to, you know, develop that muscle, the muscle of the dominant comes along as well, again, to help flex that other piece. And and so good auxiliary focus or good focus on developing that auxiliary function can simultaneously grow and develop and stretch the dominant. It'll give you more opportunities and contexts and environments in which to do that. And I think a question that gets asked a lot is how do I know when I have done sufficient growth in any specific function? And I think when it comes to particularly your first two functions, the dominant auxiliary, 
I don't think there's ever a time when you're going to stop, quote unquote, growing those functions because, well, unless you've just decided as a person you're going to stop growing. All right. Like if you feel like you've gotten to the acme of where you can be as an individual and or you just are done growing yourself. Yeah. It'd be like asking, like, when should I stop learning in life? Yeah. You, don't you want to learn until the day you die? Yeah. Right? And, and some people don't. They're like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm just going to kick it. <laughs> and that's fine. You're allowed to do that. Right. You can do anything you want with your life. And when it comes to the dominant auxiliary function, if you're a person who is in a growth mindset and sees perpetual opportunities to grow as a person, these will be growing with you. They'll be coming along for the ride. But looking at it through the lens of leverage and sort of the um, law of diminishing returns, like what's the moment when I can feel confident enough to know that I've done sufficient work in this function to maybe take my intense focus off of it and apply it to now other parts of me if you know uh, assuming that you're using cognitive functions as a developmental tool and you're focusing on them one at a time after you have developed your auxiliary function we always say well then now it's now it's the best time to balance out the second and the third function or the co-pilot and the auxiliary function or um, excuse me co-pilot and 10 year old and uh, and I think a very valid question is when how do you know that you've developed your auxiliary copilot enough to move on to that next piece? And I think it's the, basically the same litmus test as when you know your dominant is decent enough to stop hyper focusing all the time or unconsciously being there. And that is when you implement that auxiliary copilot so instinctively that it's the first tool that you grab. Right. Like you're always in your dominant or driver. And then when problems and challenges come up, you know, you've done sufficient auxiliary copilot work when the problem surfaces and you're immediately trying to find a solution in both your driver and copilot. Like they're they're already talking about it. Those two functions are already on the job. And when you get to a point where they are struggling to solve the problem, like they they are consulting each other, you're employing all of the things you've learned, all the skills and ta- um, all the skills that you have developed on top of your natural talent. When you do that and you go, I think that we need another voice in here. I think that there's actually more things that need to be taken into consideration. That's when you've done sufficient auxiliary or co-pilot work. And that's when you really need to start flexing the muscle of some of these other functions because you have done a good job of making sure that you instinctively go to that auxiliary, which is really the point. The point is to have developed and implemented these two functions in conjunction with each other, the driver and the co-pilot, so many times that you have built faith in it. You've built faith that it is the right it's the it's the winning combination. It's the two things that put you in the best space. And so any moment when it's not working out by using those top two functions together in conjunction with each other at, at their best, by the way, it, it, any function that's not well developed will not be the right tool for the job most of the time <laughs> because you're just not going to have very much um, flexibility with it. But if you've gotten to a place where both these functions that you have natural talent in, that you've done sufficient skill development and they're flexible, agile tools, and you use them often enough and you've created a context or a world or a life or environment that allows you to grab them on a regular basis, and then they're not the right tool for the job and it surprises you, that's oftentimes a signal that, okay, if I just use these two functions all the time, that will actually be one-sidedness. So what's interesting about one-sidedness is it's it's a moving target. It's not just one thing. It's not like, oh, I'm overusing my dominant or I'm overusing just an element of my dominant or, you know, well, then the, the key is to get into your auxiliary and you won't be one-sided anymore. Well, once, you've ju- once you're just relying on those two and if you only continue to do that, then you are one-sided yet again, right? And then if you only work on the four functions in your stack or in the car model, And let's say you beautifully move through all of them and you're only ever using those functions and never calling in on your fifth or eighth. Once again, you're one sided. So one sidedness is not something that is a static concept. It's a moving target that accommodates for growth and development. And any time we get lazy or rest in our laurels or just keep using things as one trick pony, 
that's an example of one-sidedness. So I guess the answer to that idea of when is my co-pilot sufficiently developed, I guess the answer could be when a combination of the driver and the co-pilot together is actually creating its own dynamic of one-sidedness. And that's when you're ready to start really focusing on the balancing act between the co-pilot and the 10-year-old or the auxiliary and the tertiary. I want to unpack that more, maybe even on a future show, because I think there's a there's a value in that question of how do I know a function is more developed or developed enough in order to move on to the next in the sequence, because we do talk about function development from a sequence standpoint. Going back to the dominant function, one way you could look at this idea of one-sidedness, so just taking your dominant driver function, whatever that is for you, look at your personality type, look at the car model at personalityhacker.com and determine based on your type, what is that driver or dominant function? There is a very basic expression of them that Dr. Nardi talks about, which is the, like we, what we mentioned, the holistic versus analytic. Just that alone could give you some information for yourself. If you look at some of the descriptions around that in his Magic Diamond book, for example, you can get a flavor. So for example, as an ENFP, I show up with extroverted intuition as my dominant driver function. And I could look and say, am I more holistic with my extroverted intuition or am I more analytic? Which one do I lean more toward? And right there, from my standpoint, that's a growth path for me to focus maybe on leaning into the other side of that. I think I tend to be more analytic in my extroverted intuition in how I express it. And I think there's an opportunity for me to lean more toward the holistic expression of it, round that out. So I think there's an opportunity just from that standpoint to apply specifically to your dominant driver function. There's a growth opportunity here for me. And for you too, listening, because in your personality, you probably lean toward one side or the other in that little you know, basic breakdown, one-sidedness of that. And again, it's not like you're an incomplete person or there's something wrong with you or you're broken. These are opportunities. They're not deficiencies you necessarily have to overcome. If I just spent the rest of my life you know, more focused on the analytic extroverted intuition, it's not like I'm, I'm going to necessarily ruin my life or I've got all these deficiencies or problems now, maybe there's some challenges that leaning into the holistic side would help me manage or move through better. And so anytime we're talking about growth, we're not always just talking about healing or fixing something that's broken. We're also talking about optimizing, stretching ourselves and adding to our toolbox. So I just want to make sure we make that determination as well. It can be easy to paint all personal growth in, oh, I'm broken. I've got to fix something. And we could also look at it as hey, I'm doing good and I want to optimize something, which I think is a much better framework for most people to, to be moving forward with is I want to continue to optimize myself in a forward progression. Yeah. Well, and the more you do that, the easier life becomes. So it's really like, I may not be broken, but I'm still struggling. <laughs> sure. And I don't want to struggle anymore. And so being a more well-rounded person keeps me from struggling. Or And ev not even so much now. I think to t to your point, this idea of I might not be dealing with all sorts of traumas that I have to heal from, but I might want to optimize myself. It might not be for my experience in this moment. It might be for my experience down the line. Like growth now is giving a gift to your future self. It's when you get to a place and you're like, I mean, when I get to retirement, am I going to be like, oh, shit, I didn't plan for this because I'm an ENTP and ENTPs don't think about the future that way. Am I going to allow myself to rest into my personality to make excuses for, for why I have a terrible experience as an elderly person? Or am I going to future pace right now and go, maybe I don't want to live with regrets. Maybe I want to recognize that there are things I need to be doing now in order to plan for a better future experience. And when I'm less one-sided, I understand those things more. Like I realized one of the ways that I future pace as an ENTP is I am actually not using introverted intuition much to future pace. What I'm doing is I'm projecting myself into the future and then I'm using a like more of like an extroverted intuition, introverted sensing. I'm using a combination of those two things to to project myself into the future and ask myself, what's my SI or introverted sensing going to regret? So I'm actually putting myself at the end of the movie reel and then looking back on it, you know, sort of uh, ruminating on how I could have done things. That's not a very NI way of going about it or introverted intuition way of going about it. I'm not like seeing running a bunch of simulations about how it could happen and then finding the stream that's the most likely. I'm not doing that at all. 
I'm going, what do I not want to regret? What does my future introverted sensing function want to be experiencing? And so uh, by not allowing myself to be too one-sided and give myself excuses for being extroverted intuition all the time, by allowing myself to, you know, to go, well, maybe, maybe I need to uh, develop a little bit more of that fourth function of introverted sensing. Maybe I need to understand, even if it's not development, maybe I need to understand its impact in my life and how it operates in me, how I have a tendency to feel regret when I don't do the things I'm supposed to be doing. And it haunts me. And so in order to account for that in the future, even if I'm not, quote unquote, actively developing it right now, I'm making space for it and recognizing how it's going to impact me in the future. And I want to account for that. And so I'm going to make better choices. So I think the piece of the one sidedness is also it's not just brokenness now. It's what are the kinds of things I will unintentionally break along the way if I'm not, you know, keeping my finger on the pulse of my need to cover all of these bases. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. So that idea of one-sidedness in the dominant function, I think, is an opportunity for growth, leaning more into something else that maybe isn't showing up for you as much. Another opportunity here, I think, for our dominant function is to create space for it, create more space for it. I mean, we assume because it's our dominant or driver, however you're wired in your personality, the assumption is that you've already made space for it in your life. You know, I, I, I talked about earlier, it's like a fish in water. This is the experience that you bring to the world and it's everything kind of filters through it. And also you might be in a context that does limit that to some degree. A long time ago, we did a podcast on religion and personality types. And we basically said, if you're in a religious context that honors your dominant or driver function, you probably will be able to stay there for a long time, maybe indefinitely. But if you are in a religious context that suppresses or denies or hijacks your dominant or driver process, you may have a shelf life on how long you could stay in that religion. Now, you could apply that to anything, any ideology, political framework, social group, belief structure. It doesn't have to be religion, but it does speak to this idea that space needs to be made in your life for your dominant or driver to show up, or there will be a shelf life for how long you can healthily like, operate in that world. And so being conscious of how much honor your driver or dominant function is getting in the world that you occupy is a good thing to do. Understand how much am I allowed to express this with all the rules that are in the world that I operate, and maybe some adjustments need to be made. Maybe you need to make some more space for that dominant process to fully express itself. And just having the right context with the space you need can be something that can grow that dominant function in and of itself. It might feel a little confusing. Actually, I was just putting myself in the position of the listener. And it might be a little confusing because it, it sounds like we're saying two different things, like contradictory things. The first is don't be too much in your dominant. And the other is make sure that you're living a life that honors your dominant and allows it to do more and express more. So which one is it? And the answer is, um, it's both. <laughs> you need to develop, you need to create an environment that is ergonomic to your dominant function. Like the more oppressed your dominant feels, the more it's going to be create, like basically showing up with little temper tantrums. It will make sure that it is expressed. It'll just do it in unconscious and intentional but unconscious ways. And because you don't want your unconscious self to be running the show, because you want to, as much as possible, be able to reflect on your behavior and determine whether or not this is how you want to show up to the world, then creating an environment that gives your dominant function space to develop, to play, to stretch, to explore itself in all of its you know different layers 
that's critical for, you know, just basically being a healthy person. And once you create an environment that is ergonomic to it and gives it all sorts of opportunities to grow with you and help you become a more confident person and better self-expressed, that's when you want to really make sure that you're not hyper leaning on it, that you're ignoring all of these other components because you already are wired to kick everything you learn from the other functions back up to the dominant. We're wired to default to it. We're wired to assume everything needs to enter and pass through it as a point of, you know, sort of a point of exit and entry. And so because we're wired to hyper value it and to overuse it, you want to make sure that you're not, um, you're not sort of painting yourself in a corner or leaving, quote unquote, leaving money on the table by not utilizing it. But you also want to make sure that it is not a monster in your life that is completely running the show and that you can't get out of it and see things from other perspectives. If you are in a context that does not allow you to express it, it's going to be the thing that you're always contending with. And so you won't be able to get out of that and grow other parts of you because you'll be struggling so much at trying to like make this show up, even unconsciously, like you mentioned, Antonia, that creating a context and space for it, giving it space to roam free or giving it space to express itself you know, for a time you might indulge it, but then after a while, now it's got, it has what it needs. It's sated. So you're able to access those other functions, I think is what you're saying. And I think that's a really good point. It's not, they're not contradictory. They're sequential. Like it's, you need to attend to give your dominant space so it can feel sated and comfortable and relaxed. So it doesn't feel like it's always fighting for its life. And then it allows you to not have to always be there all the time. You can grow other parts of yourself. Yeah. I almost, I would say that sometimes type growth or like cognitive function development is sequential and I think other times it's simultaneous we can actually be focused on multiple functions at the same time when you want to stop all traffic and focus on just one function to really hyper you know um well I guess I use the word focus a lot so I won't use the word hyper focus what I say uh give it lots of attention and really nourish it so it can flourish that's usually when you recognize how important it is in your life and how much you've been neglecting it, which is oftentimes what we discover we've done with our auxiliary copilot function. And so if you have done sufficient environmental ergonomics for your dominant or driver function, if you've done that, most of the time, the only time you have to like stop all production and focus on a, a function is when you recognize that you've ignored or neglected your auxiliary or copilot for so long that it's created a life that makes you unhappy. And you might have to sort of burn your life down in some ways, not all aspects of your life, but you may have to make, I'll just say this, big shifts in order to accommodate this part of you that may have gone neglected for a long time. And that feels like, that feels like 100% co-pilot or auxiliary growth or development when you, when you make those huge shift in, shifts in your life to accom- accommodate what might have been a marginalized part of yourself. But simultaneously, you are also going to be bringing in other aspects of who you are because every single situation we run into requires multiple tools in order to solve it. So while you're doing developmental growth projects or life changes in order to accommodate the co-pilot or auxiliary function, you may also at the same time be developing your fifth function, right? That's not uncommon. Um, the fifth function is in the same attitude as your auxiliary. And so I noticed that when I did a lot of introverted thinking work as my auxiliary function, when I was doing a ton of introverted thinking work, I also was simultaneously doing a lot of introverted intuition work (laughs) because I needed to see things from different perspectives inside my mind. And so it's not uncommon that that function will also show up a lot. It's just, it just may not be something you're as aware of. And when you're not aware of it, again, as soon as it happens, you have a tendency to kick the results of it up to your dominant. So it just feels like you're in your dominant all the time. And so getting just real sensitive to the interplay of these functions and how they show up, I think, is a big part of how we track and chart our growth and development and where we're at in all of this. And um, and I think the fifth function actually is a is a function that comes along for the ride a lot. It's something that we tend to pull on. And we sometimes just sort of miss its implication because it is so easy to throw it up to its its cousin, right? Or its sibling, you could say, which is the same function you're using for your first, only in a different attitude. So we talked about the opportunity for your 
driver dominant function to grow it with this idea of the function itself, one-sidedness, how's it expressing? Can you lean into more aspects of that dominant function, round it out, absorb more territory with it? We talked about there's an opportunity for context to ensure that you have the context to express it fully, and you might have to make some changes. And when it has that context and that freedom of expression, often then it can relax. It can do growth work there, but it can relax and make space for other function development in your personality. So we talked about the function. We talked about the context. Let's talk about association. So one of the things I think also in this opportunity for a dominant function is to get around other people that use that function well, whether it's their driver or co-pilot. Often it's going to be other drivers similar to you using that function, maybe in a little bit of a different way than you're using it. Spending some time around another ENFP or ENTP for myself using extrovert intuition can be very valuable because I'm seeing all the ways they're using it that I'm not using it. And I can almost pick it up intuitively. It is an intuitive process, but also just by being around it, you know, almost marinating in it, being around it, being seen expressed in different ways that maybe I don't express in or not as much, I'm learning very quickly. And so I don't care what type you are. You might be an ISFP and introverted feeling might be your driver or dominant. And going, getting around other introverted feeling users, especially dominant users, you're going to pick up so much for how they're using their introverted feeling, just being around them. So I think association with people using this function well can also accelerate your growth for that dominant. Yeah, well, and it goes on down the line. This is why it's really good to have lots of different friends or at least a lot of different personality types in your world and in your life. Because I, I think that that principle of association, which is so important, can be carried out even further, which is, you know, if you're trying to develop your auxiliary or co-pilot function, hanging out with somebody who uses that function as their dominant or driver is really helpful. <laughs> Like, it's like, oh, this is how it's used when it's being done very well. I mean, particularly if they're a healthy person who has done that work of creating an ergonomic environment that allows their function, their dominant function to stretch. Those people are invaluable when you are trying to to grow and develop your auxiliary function. And then hanging out with people who maybe have your fifth function as their first. As an ENTP, I learn so much from INJs. I learn a ton from people who lead with introverted intuition. And then when I'm in the mode to develop my sixth function or when I'm at a place where that's really important, finding people, for me, my sixth function is extroverted thinking or effectiveness, finding people who are ETJs and hanging out with them and observing how they go about things is massively invaluable. Hanging out with people who have my fourth function of introverted sensing, ISJs, it gives me so much appreciation for a function that I may otherwise hold little value in. Right, Something that I might want to push away when I get around ISJs, I go, oh, this is why this function is so important. <laughs> this is why it's so good. And they teach me ways in which my function's most likely influencing me and I'm blind to it. I don't even see how it's influencing me until I observe how it's influencing them. And I'm like, what's the quiet version of this? What's the, what's the quiet sneak up on me version? And I go, oh, well, in the future, I don't want to have a bunch of regrets. And then with your seventh and eighth function, which probably is not, they're not functions that you're going to do a lot of development or growth in, most likely. And people who represent those functions are some of the best in your life for just giving yourself space to access them, even if it's not your own journey. Even if it's just observing the beautification that these functions bring into your life by um, by just having them represented somewhere or having somebody else, you know, handling that. And then observing, I, I think I missed the third function. For me as an ENTP, it's extroverted feeling. Having people in my life that do this function really well, it creates humility in me. Like anytime I get too big for my britches and I think my extroverted feeling is amazing, all I have to do is hang out with somebody who has it as a dominant function for like an hour and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, now I understand how I'm limited here. And now I understand how it actually is there to serve my auxiliary or co-pilot, not be the star of the show. And so, again, just having a variety of these types in your life and having association with them can help so much in calibrating where you're at in your growth, understanding the value of these functions, recognizing your personal relationship to them as they're mirrored back to you. All of that's super important. I think you make a really good point in other functions in your personality, like extroverted feeling for you, Antonia, that you realize 
like how well they're doing it. Maybe somebody that uses that as a driver or dominant and how that makes you feel. And I, I want to address specifically the driver dominant and the feelings you might have if you're listening and you take this advice and you start to spend time around, you know, spend time around all these other people, obviously, for all the functions in your personality. But if you're going to put specific focused effort into finding people that you can hang around that use this function that you also use as a driver or dominant function, I want to caution you because I think two primary things might show up for you just to be aware of this. And you might even avoid hanging out with people using your function because of these things. I think one thing that can come up for you is a little bit of insecurity because you're seeing them maybe get better results or different results than you using the same function as you as a driver or dominant. And here you're like, well, what's wrong with me? Why are they getting better results? Or why are why do people like them better? Or man, and you, you might feel a little insecure, maybe even envious a little bit from seeing them use this and use it in a way that you aren't always accessing. So even though it's an example and it might give you some insight into what you could also be stretching into in your dominant driver, that insecurity might come up. So just watch for that. And I think also with the potential envy that comes, I think competition can also come here. I think you can see somebody using that driver dominant function. And instead of being in a learning student frame to really pay attention, okay, how are they using this in a good way? you get that competitive trigger of I'm going to prove myself. I'm going to prove the fact that I'm using this well. You know, it's unconscious probably, but it triggers that little bit of competitiveness. Like I do it better. And like you want to jump in instead of learning. Now you're in a competitive frame. So just be aware of those potentially arising as you spend time with someone using your dominant driver function that you use. I think that can also come from it. Yeah. One of the challenges I've always had is when somebody's using my functions differently than I do, Unfortunately, my mind initially goes to, oh, they're using it wrong. <laughs> That's why my brain yeah. goes. My brain is like, oh, you're using that function wrong. You should be using it like I do. <laughs> and I, I've i gotten to a place where I am so grateful for when my ego gets bruised, right? When I when I observe another ENTP in a room and maybe they're like faster on the, on the upswing with a joke than I am. And I'm like hey, that was supposed to be mine. <laughs> and there's that little bit of competitive, like there there can be only one. Now, I don't think every type experiences this as much. It might be it might be something that types like us, like ENPs in particular, deal with because we like to be so iconoclastic and there's only one of us. I suspect when like EFJs get around each other, they're just peas in a pod and they're just like super happy that no way. There's They're competition. Vibing. You just don't see it because you're not FE. Well, I'm sure that there are moments of competition if there's an opportunity for them to flex, you know, what they're good at. <laughs> and I can imagine that that probably creates a little bit of uh, sublimated competition. But I think uh, I think there are some of us who are, who might be a little bit more likely to do that. And also, I bet there are moments when all of us do that. And so I think that that's a really important thing to to remember. And in moments of insecurity and moments of suddenly you're competitive and your ego gets bruised, man, those are such important moments to just sit with and let yourself be the child. I think when, when I get my ego bruised or I feel insecure, the first thing I want to do is somehow like rationalize or justify it by saying like, I'm not being a child. They're just dot, 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 fill in the, you know, fill in the blank about the thing they're doing that they shouldn't be doing that triggered this insecurity in me. And I've gotten to a place where every time I feel that insecurity now, I mean, I have like a moment to be human, quote unquote, like I have a moment to just like, I don't know, like think all of the the nasty little thoughts and, and assume that they're, you know, everybody else's fault. But once the moment to be human is over, one of one of the most powerful things that I have learned from some of my teachers and coaches is to just sit in that space of being very childlike in my insecurity and and go no i'm 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 the one who's really contending with something here and it's routing back to something i probably need to look at and it's routing back to something that i need to see and be aware of and bring bring more consciousness around which is really one of the best values of type development one of the best value, values of type development is turning all of these little unconscious habits that we have into something that's conscious and as soon as we do that we're no longer stuck in personality I love the phrase being stuck in personality, which is what I, I, I robbed it from our friends who teach Enneagram. It's a, I think it's something that um, the Enneagram world 
uses as a phrase far more often than Myers Briggs does. And I think we could, I think we should steal it for Myers Briggs as well, which is this idea of being in personality. And that's not always a good thing, right? Like doing these unconscious behaviors and clinging to our right to be one sided, which is basically going like, well, I'm an ENTP, so I can't do that. Or I'm an ENTP, what do you expect? I mean, you can say that in humor sometimes, right? It's kind of funny, especially when... St- is it? Is it? <laughs> well, sometimes when stereotypes <laughs> come up and it's like, I guess I'm, I'm just an ENTP. I'm like five minutes late again. And when you use it as an excuse for terrible behavior or or even for unconscious behavior, yeah, then I think that um, I think that if you are aware of systems like this and tools like this and you're not using them to create more consciousness around these behaviors, then again, you're leaving money on the table. <laughs> like there's so much that could be used with the, these awareness and understandings. And so a big part of it too is as we talk about, oh, what's your relationship with your dominant? What's your relationship with your auxiliary? Hang around with people who like represent all these functions. Be really clear about whether or not you're overvaluing something. When we make all of these recommendations, the implicit, uh, imp- well, I guess I should say the implication is that every moment that you're not doing it the, the most optimized way is a moment that you need to be sitting with that and feeling all the feelings that come along with realizing that you might be doing it in a limited way or you might be doing it in a way that doesn't serve you long term. Or this is an example of one-sidedness, not an example of, you know, the best version of your type. Like being really willing to like sit with um, all the ways that understanding how you're using your functions might make you feel insecure and like you could be doing better like those are all those those are good moments. Like they're not bad moments. It's not like the tool isn't working. Those are all moments that indicates the tool is working. And then you navigate through those experiences, get to the other side, and then oftentimes you don't have to feel that feeling again. At least not in that specific way. When it comes to the dominant function, driver function, it can be challenging to see how we might be mis like you're talking about maybe not using it in the best way possible because we're going to tend to always put a spin on the fact this is good what I'm doing, right? So as an example, just from my personality type, again, ENFP, when I get stuck or I have a challenge, let's say in the business, in Personality Hacker, and we're behind on something or something's not working out and I just need to put my head down and get the work done. Often what I'll do to quote unquote solve the problem is I'll create something new. I'll try, well, we'll we'll solve the problem by creating even more new things, right? And my function of extrovert intuition, new and novel and patterns and having brainstorm sessions, I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, this is the wrong approach. Like it's not obvious immediately unless I'm really paying attention to that situation. So I've had to really rein it in and go, wait, the solution here is put my head down and plow through this, not start opening more loops to solve a problem that I have or a challenge that I've got. And that took a lot of reflection time. And you are going to have the same thing in your personality as a dominant driver. There's something that you're doing to solve challenges or lean on your driver. And all the narrative, everything you're going to tell yourself, oh, this is exactly what I should be doing. This is how I should be solving it. Maybe you're an INJ. And instead of just going and executing the outer world, you're like, well, I need to ruminate more about this. This challenge to be noodled on a little bit longer. And you're going to have all the reasons why that's the right thing to do. And you're going to have every reason in the book that you're going to tell me, Joel, this is why I have to sit and think about it for another month before I execute on it. And it's going to be hard because it's like they're noble. They're like, they're good reasons and you're going to totally resonate with them. They're going to totally make sense to you. And yet just watch for that because I think there's something here around our dominant that comes in. It's hard to, it's hard to see where when we're using it, it's actually not the right, the right tool sometimes. So We've gone on a bunch of different tangents in this conversation. We've gone down a couple different roads. We've wrapped in other functions besides just the dominant. So let's go right back to the dominant again and just review one more time. I think there's three primary areas here for us to look for opportunities of growth in our dominant function. It's the function itself. How is the function being expressed as the dominant driver function? Are we leaning toward one side or another of how we express it? Can we lean toward the other side and wrap in more territory? We talked about the context of the function, giving it space to express itself and grow, and the context itself matters for the function to develop. And then we talked about association, being around other people that use your same dominant driver function and use it well, 
and learning from them just by being around them, just observing and being around their energy and watching how they're using it, there's an opportunity for growth here. A ton of understanding, I think, can come from that as well. So three areas, the function, the context, and the association are three primary areas to, to have opportunity to grow yourself in this way. That was a beautiful summary. You like that? Yeah. No, that was really good. It's my TE tertiary, just giving like a bullet list. <laughs> I know. Boom, boom, boom. No, that was excellent. And I think um, this is the kind of thing that you wouldn't have let me say, say at the beginning of the podcast. But now that the podcast is pretty much wrapped up, I can say it now. I hope that anything I said in this podcast made sense because my brain is not, it's not banging on all cylinders <laughs> today. <laughs> it's working well. It's uh, it's more random access than normal. Yeah. I'm having a really hard time sort of like bringing my thoughts into, you know, something that's like a really nice, strong beam. And so I'm really grateful to you for constantly <laughs> bringing it because I think, I think you'd say something I'd be like, yeah. And then I would just like start talking about 10 other things and you'd be like, okay, back to the dominant because <laughs> that was ostensibly the purpose of this entire podcast. And you start talking about the dominant I'd be like, oh yeah, that makes me think of. And then I talk about <laughs> 10 other things over here. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful that you gave this beautiful summary at the end. And I hope that my tangents weren't no. as you know, and as tangential as I'm in retrospect realizing they probably were. <laughs> well, to be fair, two things I have to say about that. One is we've been teaching a lot lately. We've been running, you've been running NT Women workshops with a group of NT Women. We just did our live event at the Profiler Training event. We did a virtual event for Profiler Training. We just did a virtual event. We just did a one-sidedness workshop with Dr. Nardi. Uh, we just checked in with our Magic Diamond students earlier today as well yeah. for like an hour to see where they're at in their journey. So we've been switching gears and oscillating so quickly in the last few weeks that it makes sense that your information is just all over the place right now. It's hard to like focus on one thing, right? It really is. It's all over the place. <laughs> and everything, I, I forget what I've said where. And so everything I say, I'm always like, am I repeating myself? And it's yeah. it's because I probably am, but not for this context. I said that I said this thing in this other context, Yeah. but it feels like I'm repeating it to this audience so yeah anyway so thank you very much for summarizing i really appreciate it and i hope i hope i wasn't too uh random access on this particular podcast well and then the second point i was going to say is i think you listening probably appreciate some of these rabbit trails in conversation as long as we can have a through line for it and tony i think it's totally fine because i think if you're listening you probably enjoy abstract conversation, even if you're not an intuitive, you probably are a sensor that has intuitive mindset. And so you probably appreciate all the abstract what ifs, rabbit trails. It stimulates the mind. So I think, you know, the person listening right now is going to totally resonate with some of the stuff you brought up. So I think it's totally cool. Yeah, we'll see. Like every once in a while, somebody's like, do they ever make any sense ever? And I'm like, uh, I think this person wanted a webinar. <laughs> and I'm like, this is just not my webinar presentation. P the podcast is me talking into a microphone and just saying whatever comes up next in my mind. Right. Sometimes my brain, my mind is very well organized and other times it is not. So I guess today was a not organized one. But thank you, Joel, for having my back and saying it probably was OK. And I'm like, I'm going to I'm going to believe you. I'm going to I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to lean into probably. <laughs> Well, let's find out. You've been listening. What's been coming up for you? What is your growth strategy for your dominant or driver function? Have you noticed opportunities outside of maybe the three I talked about, the three we talked about, the function itself, the context, or the association? Do you have other ways that you've seen yourself grow that dominant driver function? Come over to personalityhacker.com. Directly below this episode, you can leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story. What what has been your experience? Stories are really powerful because it gives a personal experience in your life. It's an example. It shows how it actually plays out. It gets out of the realm of theory and puts it into personal application. So hearing about your personal story is so powerful. Mm. And if you totally dig disorganized thoughts and tangents and rabbit trails, you can subscribe to this podcast and various platforms and iTunes. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. It's way better organized. I promise. We put a lot of time and effort into it. So go check out the book Personality Hacker. You can find it on Amazon and all major book retailers and retailers. And if you leave us a reading, rating and review on 
Amazon and on Goodreads that also helps us out a lot. You haven't been drinking, have you? No, but I wish I had now <laughs> because then I would justify my weird slurring and my inability to complete this podcast. We've been doing a lot of teaching lately. It's it's tiring, I know. Yeah, I, I think next time I'm going to kick it with a glass of wine. Oh, boy. Not tea. I usually use tea, but I think next time glass of wine is going to be required for the podcast. Okay, where am I at in my stream of things? I think you're going to talk about uh, if they're interested. If someone, if you're listening and you're interested in personal growth. Oh, yes, that's right. Tailored to your personality type. That's right. This is, hey, why don't you do it? <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in personal growth tailored to your personality type, we have an entire suite of programs and products over at personalityhacker.com. We've got a product catalog there with different programs in different areas of life. Just your personality in general. We've got starter kits for every one of the 16 types. More advanced material about growing each of those types. We've got programs for that as well. Uh, and then we also have topical programs in the area of business and career, relationships, and, uh, and then more professional development end of things as well over mm -hmm. at personalityhacker.com. Dot com. Yeah, I think I do that part better. Yeah, okay. really? Oh, I thought I did pretty good. I like that. No, you did good. I was like, I was like proud of it. I'm like, hey, this is pretty relaxed actually, and chill. I like it. Actually, you said it like you were saying it for the first time, so it didn't seem like it was off of a script. So you actually probably did a better job than I do. I don't know. We should stop being insecure now and just wrap it up. How Let's do you, wrap what do you it say up. I'm gonna go get a glass of wine now. Really? Oh yeah, that's where I'm headed. All right. All right. My name is Joel Mark Witt, and I'm Antonia Dodge, and we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.